Meiosis and Sexual Life Cycles Our learning goal for today is to understand the process of meiosis as well as its importance for genetic variability. Our success criteria is to be able to compare and contrast mitosis and meiosis as well as identify steps in meiotic cell division and its importance to creating variability in the offspring. These are the questions we're going to answer. At the end of this lesson, you'll see the same questions, and using your notes, you'll answer them with your lab partner. Mitosis ends with two daughter cells. You start with one cell, you make two cells. That's during mitotic cell division. Daughter cells have the same number of chromosomes as the parent cell, 46 for us humans. This is a review of your previous class. And remember, we produced all the cells in your body from that fertilized egg about 15, 16, 17, or 18 years ago. An easy way to remember that body cells are made by mitosis is mito is made by mitosis. The process that we're going to talk about today is called meiosis, or making sex cells. And of course, your toe was not made by meiosis because it's not made of sex cells. Your toe was made by mitosis. Some more review. Uh, cell division is a type of asexual reproduction. The prefix a means without. And mitosis doesn't require a male or female source of genetic material. During mitosis, you produce cells with the same information, identical daughter cells. These are exact copies or clones of each other. All the cells in your bodies are clones of every other cell because they have the same genetic information. And it also has the same amount of DNA. You have the same number of chromosomes and the same genetic information. When you make new body cells by mitosis, you start with 46 chromosomes and you end with 46 chromosomes. Asexual reproduction, no male or female involved, but reproducing, making copies. Single-celled eukaryotes reproduce asexually. Things like yeast, paramecium, and amoeba will all divide in half during mitosis to produce extra copies of themselves. There is no male or female involved. Also, some simple multicellular eukaryotes can reproduce asexually as well. However, most living things that are multicellular reproduce with two sexes, sexually, with things like trees and fungus and humans and most more complicated creatures will do sexual reproduction. However, we have an example here called a hydra. A hydra is about the size of your fingernail and it reproduces asexually. It's relative to jellyfish. Over here, we have this little guy here being made by asexual means. It's a clone. All we're doing is mitosis of the body cells and as this gets bigger and bigger, it'll pinch off, and now you've got two hydras, and they're genetically identical to each other. This is a method of asexual reproduction. Some organisms can do both sexual and asexual reproduction. For example, starfish can reproduce asexually when you break off their arms. The arms grow a whole new starfish. This process of asexual reproduction, where you grow a new multicellular organism with uh, mitosis, is called budding. Here's budding in yeast, basically making a copy by mitosis that's exactly identical to the cell it came from. The word we use for single-celled organisms doing mitosis or making a copy, of, an exact copy of themselves, is called binary fission. Here we have binary fission of an amoeba, making two copies from one, two cells from one cell. At this time, we're going to go to our notes and um, get some information about genes as well as asexual reproduction. In front of you, you should have some uh, blank sheets of paper. At the top of your paper, let's go ahead and write down meiosis notes. Now for the AP Biology class, this is chapter 13. Also, let's go ahead and make sure that we list the number in our, um, in our notes, which page number we're doing, so that we don't get those confused. The first thing I'd like you to write down is what is a gene? And we're going to need that information later, especially when we talk about genetics after meiosis. Now a gene is a sequence of DNA that holds the codes for making a protein that will in turn make a trait. Offsprings acquire genes from parents by inheriting chromosomes. You may have heard that you get your brown hair from your mom. You're not actually getting the hair from your mom. You're getting the gene, which is a sequence of DNA, to make a protein that will in turn make the brown hair. Let's go ahead and skip this out. Let's go ahead and put down a chromosome. This is our chromosome here. And remember, a chromosome is just DNA wrapped around these histone proteins, kind of highly coiled. So let's expand that out a little bit. 
We have our DNA molecule, sequences of adenines, thymines, guanines, and cytosines. There's no actual letters on the molecule, but those are the names of the bases that will spell out the, the alphabet of the genetic language that we all carry. A sequence of DNA is called a gene. For example, this might be the gene for brown hair color that codes for the proteins to make the color of your hair brown. You can also have a gene for blonde hair as well, or red hair, or any hair color that you want to talk about. Continuing on, we're going to talk a little bit about asexual reproduction, but first, let's get some more notes. Genes code for proteins that make traits. Living things pass on their traits using genes on chromosomes. Now, how a DNA sequence makes a protein that makes a trait will be the subject of a future class. However, and I should also point out at this point, that genes are usually not just six nucleotides. There are usually thousands of nucleotides. So this is kind of an oversimplification. The last thing you should write down in your notes under um, genes is locus. What is a locus? A locus is a gene's location on a chromosome. For example, if the gene for hair color is located here, the locus for the gene for hair color would be located here. And we need some notes on asexual reproduction now. For asexual reproduction, you should write down the definition. The offspring gets exact copies of genes from the parents during asexual reproduction, or sex without, no sex involved. There is no male or female. We're making genetically identical copy, copies called clones. A clone is a genetically identical copy. Nature's clones would be things like identical twins that came from the same fertilized egg. Mitosis, or making exact copies, produces the clones. Yeast and bacteria do something called binary fission, basically single cells dividing. And here we have a little sketch of our hydra, a little relative to the jellyfish, about the size of your fingernail, lives in the water, and the little budding of a clone, asexually. That would be a good example to know. So how about the rest of us? What if a complex multicellular organism, like us, wants to reproduce? Well, we have to join sperm and egg. How do we make sperm and egg? Is it by mitosis? Well, if the egg had 46 chromosomes and the sperm had 46 chromosomes, we would have a zygote, or a fertilized egg, with 92 chromosomes. And that doesn't work out for us. This is a karyotype for a female. A karyotype is a picture of the chromosomes that show all the pairs of chromosomes that you got from mom and dad. You have two of chromosome number one, one set you got from mom, one set from dad, two of chromosome number two, two of chromosome th number three, and so forth and so on, arranged from biggest to smallest. They have to find a cell in mitosis, or prophase, metaphase, anaphase, or telophase, to get these chromosomes that are condensed. Remember, during interphase, you can't see the chromosomes. We'll talk about in the future what happens when you get extra copies of the chromosomes, but you can see the extra copies on a karyotype. Also, we know this is a female because females have two X chromosomes. The X chromosome is bigger than the Y chromosome. If it is a male, you'll have an X and a Y chromosome. The last pair, the 23rd pair, is called the sex chromosomes. The other 22 pairs that code for things that are not involved with sex are called autosomes. I'm going to stop at this point and take some more notes. At this point, let's write down some notes about sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction is two sources of genetic material, not just one in asexual reproduction, passed on to the offspring. The offspring are not genetically identical to the parents. It includes most multicellular organisms, plants, animals, proteins, and many fungi. Sex cells are made by meiosis, different from mitosis, but it's still cell division, and are not exact copies of the starting cell. So let's go ahead and write down a little table here of the pros and cons, the benefits and disadvantages of both types of reproduction. In asexual reproduction, 
if the organism's already well adapted in a stable environment, the clones will also be well adapted. They're making genetically identical copies. There's no need to find mates either. That's kind of a benefit. However, the disadvantage of asexual reproduction is in a changing environment where the traits that you might have that are passed on are not a benefit anymore. The offspring will then have less likely chance of survival if they don't have new traits that could be uh, made by another process, the process of sexual reproduction. In sexual reproduction, in a changing environment, the offsprings are different and may be more likely to have survival traits, with diversity has more of a chance of having an offspring that can survive in a changing environment that could pass on those traits to the next generation. However, the disadvantage of sexual reproduction is that you have to find a mate, whereas you don't have to do that in asexual reproduction. Karyotypes, or pairs of chromosomes, shown in a picture. A karyotype is a picture of the chromosomes. Here we have the uh, simplified picture that you just saw, showing the chromosome pairs lined up, including the X and Y chromosome, not listed. Karyotype is a pair, are the pairs of chromosomes arranged from largest to smallest. Here we have a pair of chromosomes, 46 total, 23 pairs total. Pairs 1 through 22 are the non-sex chromosomes. These are called autosomes. The last pair, the 23rd pair that we all have, are called the sex chromosomes. If you're a male, you have one X and one Y chromosome. A female has two X chromosomes. Keep in mind, if you get an X chromosome, that doesn't make you a female, because males have an X chromosome too. However, if you, however, if you do have the Y chromosome, there are some um, things on the Y chromosome that turn that developing fetus that starts off female into a male. So the Y chromosome is important for turning a female dividing group of cells into a male. Chromosome sets. Body cells, called somatic cells, contain two sets of each chromosome. You get one set of 23 chromosomes from your dad and one set of 23 chromosomes from your mom, making a total of 46 chromosomes, or 23 pairs, per body cell. Remember, all your body cells are identical to that fertilized egg from a long time ago. Two sets of chromosomes is called diploid. The prefix di means two. All your body cells are diploid, or have two sets of chromosomes which is different from your sex cells, produced in the ovaries and testes. All sex cells are haploid, or have one set of, of 23 chromosomes. N refers to sets of chromosomes, so if it's diploid, we call that 2N for two sets, or 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs. Sex cells, sperm and eggs, are called gametes. Gametes is a generalized, generalized name for any sperm and egg. Sperm and egg um, have one set of chromosomes each, or just 23. So how do we make sperm and egg? Well, we reduce the 46 chromosomes to 23 in the process of meiosis. So mom and dad, represented in these colors, will have starting a amount of 46 chromosomes, divided in half during meiosis, not mitosis, to make 23 in the egg and sperm, and then when the egg and sperm come together, we're back at 46 during fertilization. This ends part one of your notes on meiosis.